started going slowly. Uh huh. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, which we call How Do I Introduce Systems Thinking into My Organization? Welcome again. This is organized and hosted by the Organizations Hub. And let me quickly remind you what the team is up to. We've recently delivered a third white paper, which is called the Systems View of Organizations, which we highly recommend that you download it and have a look at it. It has some very interesting concepts and visuals in there. And otherwise, we have elaborated on principles and on transformation. Oh. Here are all the colleagues from the Organizations Hub. You can see here Sanjana, Andrea, Tripura, and John as well. However, John will be a guest speaker today, which we're very happy about, as well as Anna and Mariana. And uh, maybe I can ask our guests shortly to introduce themselves. You, you can have a minute, three sentences, that's fine. Uh, maybe I ask uh, John, just to set the scene, not being rude to the ladies, but you give us a good example of how an introduction can look like. John, over to you. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. I'm um, going to be talking about systems change because this is my favorite subject. And I've been doing this for just over 20 years, which is quite horrifying, really. So my original start in the organization life was working as a manager being very dissatisfied with the way things are then I happened to join a consultancy that was working with systems thinking I've been doing that ever since so um, I do I work both in the public and private sector and I do all sorts of things really so I'm hoping that we can explore and I'm really happy to be in here and learn from other people as well the other speakers and I also run workshops to help people to learn some of the basics of this kind of work. So that's me. Thank you, Bernd. Great. Thank you, John. That was nice. Welcome. Uh, Mariana, would you like to go next and introduce yourself? Sure. Many, many thanks and many thanks for, for the invitation. Very happy to be, to be here with you. So my name is Mariana. Um, I got across system thinking approximately 10 years ago, but really looked into it in detail, uh, maybe from five years ago in 2019, I, I decided to take two years off work to study uh, in particular how we could apply systems idea to climate policies. And that is what I'm, I'm doing currently in, uh, in the work <laughs> of my organization, which is the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation and Development, where I have been for, for 12 years as, a, as an economist and policy analyst. Maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Um... Anna, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Bernd. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Smart. Um, I first came across system thinking 14 years ago. Um, I was really fortunate um, that in the first few weeks of being on the local government graduate scheme, um, some of my colleagues just said, we think you'd be really interested in this thing we've got going on in the council chamber. And so I went along and I saw all these post-it notes and there was this team of people um, from different parts of the council repair service there were you know, there, was a, there was a plumber an electrician there were some call handlers there and some managers and they were all from different bits of of what I came to appreciate was a system and they were trying to understand how it all fitted together and um, how they could make it better and I was just immediately hooked um, hooked by the idea of this and, and the thinking shifts that were going on by people at the time so I've, I've really specialized in like how can we apply systems thinking um, in organisations ever since then, um, mainly in local government, most recently in financial services, because I fancied a change. Um, so that's me. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, Mariana and John. Welcome and great to have you as our guest speakers today. The purpose of the meeting today is to really share the challenges, ideas, experiences, and perspectives when it comes to introducing systems thinking in organizations, private, public, we make no difference there. We, we have invited these three guest speakers, which we're really proud to have them. 
they will be our coaches. They will share their perspective today and they will explore what might work, what might not work, what they tried, uh, and they will share their insights and experiences. So, and since the noise has stopped and less people are coming in, we have about 60 participants, that is great. Let's have a quick look at the agenda so that we can set the scene of how we try to organize the meeting today. So we are here. We will now jump into a very short session on the Miro board. We will ask you about your experience and where you find challenges and problems. And we will ask you to put that into the Miro board. We will also ask you to explain these problems in a very short way, way. Our speakers will pick these sticky notes of yours up and I will switch off the screen sharing. You still have access to the Miro board, but this time we would la really like to spend uh, a good hour discussing, conversing and letting our speakers talk and share perspectives. They will make some summary into the Miro board as well. <laughs> And only towards the end will we go back into the Miro board. I will share the screen again so that we can all go there. We can we can have a look how the board looks like. But basically what we would then like to get out towards the end of the session, and we take water of an hour to, to wrap that part of the conversation up, we will really try to gather the topics that have resonated with you, and topics that you propose, you would like to see us elaborating on as we go further. Our idea is to co-create with you uh, the things that resonate, the biggest issues you might find, and we will ask you what that co-creation might look like. And that's what we're gonna do towards the end. So just keep that in mind. We are now sticking a little while to the Miro, then we switch it off. We let people speak, we listen, we look at them. You may continuously drop questions into the chat, just write them and we might surface them if we can, or we might address them later or on the spot. Anyways, so here we go. Let's get started then. Please go to the Miro board and please pick one of the green stickies and in principle, you just need two stickies. We want you to tell us two things. We would like you to indicate if you're working for a private or a public organization. And we would like to understand more or less what your role is. And that's all. That is the very first step. Just populate the Miro with these stickies so that we get an idea where everybody sits. We don't we don't need to know the the names of the companies or organizations. We we don't want to know that. So good. And some people might might mute. That would be helpful to us. Thank you. Okay, one sticky for your level in an organization and another sticky for the type of organization that you're working in. Maybe you're consulting them. Maybe you're still studying. So just let us know what you're aiming for. Looks good. I'm waiting for 120 stickies. Okay, for the ones which are ready, let's go a little bit further down in the Miro board. I share it here so that you can see where we are. That's we gonna. That's what we're gonna work with. That's also what our guest speakers are gonna work with. They're gonna have a look at that. 
So step two and step three, and you, you may fill this out in one go. That's perfectly fine. We have two questions for you. Since we are talking about the challenges of introducing systems thinking into organizations, we would like you to answer two questions, personal questions. What is it that you're trying to achieve in your organization? What is it that you're trying to do in the context of systems thinking? And it should be pragmatical and it should be not more than two sentences. And we appreciate if you can put it in one sentence, something along the lines, I'm trying to introduce this or that to my management, to my manager, and this is what's happening. The step three, the second question is the question, what problems, what challenges, which issues are you facing when you're trying to do this? This is right next to it, to the right of the first question. So I repeat again, first question is, what are you trying to achieve? Second question is, what are the problems and challenges that you're facing once you try exactly that? Nice, keep populating this, this looks good. Try to be short, try to be precise as you can. Don't, don't write a big paragraph, but just formulate it. And the speakers are, are looking at this, they're reading it as we go. And this will inspire the conversation that we are now going to have going forward. Nice. Maybe in some cases it might help if you give us a hint of your department, of your industry, of the type of consultancy you're in, or maybe in which stage of a product or a problem, this challenge is occurring. Maybe it's about innovation. Maybe it's about something else, but keep going. This looks good. I zoom out again. That's question number two, as I want to confirm that people are also, yes, there you are. You're already working on step number three. This is great. Keep in mind, our speakers are very busy looking at what you're writing here because we will try and inspire their reflection based on your reflection here in these sticky notes. This is important to us and we will pick this up. They will take some notes. This is great. Okay, let's try finish this up in a minute. And I would like to remind you that we're now going to spend an hour having, having our guest speakers talk us through their perspective, through their experiences and their challenges as they found them. We will, we will in principle have them speak for quite a while and they might summarize a particular topic that they have elaborated on and then we go pick another topic and this way we go in circles if it's possible to organize it that way they will take note in step number four but we will not look at the myro i'm not going to share it here you might always have a look at that that's fine but i would also like you to enjoy the talk and and appreciate the conversation so just stick to the first page. Don't move around in the Miro. We're going to do that later. And in an hour, when we are finishing the conversation, we all going to have a look at step number four, the way our speakers have filled it out. And then we're going to work again 
together on step number five. Okay, great. I think people have finished what they had to write, if that is right. And I will click the button here, I will stop sharing. And hopefully I can see all your faces. looks good and I will also not look at the Miro board anymore I leave that to the speakers and any one of you which is curious to do it um, let me open the chat because now with the support of my colleagues they are all here so John will help facilitate obviously but we also have Tripura, Sanjana, Andrea here in the room and they will look at your questions and uh, even with support of Paloma and Joss we will sometimes inspire the conversation so now <clears throat> sorry now I shall be quiet and maybe I give the word over to John and see what the team of speakers meaning John Mariana and Anna have seen so far and I let you guys take over the conversation Okay, thank you, Bernd. And um, sorry, I was just reading through all the post-its and it's really quite fascinating. There's, there's none there that, I, <laughs> that, I, that doesn't seem familiar. And I think this is one of the challenges that we all have. And I think that please feel that this isn't a challenge that's just for you. This is a challenge that I think that we all face. And what are, one of the things that I'm picking up is resistance to change so I'm going to talk about resistance to change and how systems or systems thinking and innovative approaches can help with that now that's both at an operational level and perhaps with people at a managerial level so what I'm going to talk about with my experience is that when I first started doing change what I would do is that I would set up a project and I would um, I would design something I would create something I would I would involve people a little bit in that and then I would have this thing where I think this is fantastic um, here everybody I want you to do this um, and I couldn't believe it when it didn't work now sometimes they kind of accepted it and sometimes they just wouldn't accept it but let's say they accepted it then what happened was that when I then went back afterwards, maybe a couple of months afterwards, there wasn't really any evidence of what I'd done and what I'd helped with. So I ended up thinking that change was about keeping a bit of a stick and going, no, you have to do this. Now, I don't think that works very well. And if, if that's what's happening, I now realize that perhaps there's something wrong with the approach or something different with my approach. So. I do it very differently now. And one of the things that I do differently is that I don't design anything now. I get a small team of people. Sometimes it's just one person and I design it with them. But that one person is from the front line. That person is from that service. And very often it'll be two or three and maybe not full time. But one of those people will probably be full time and, and they work together with me. And effectively, they're the ones that do the design. So they design in the reality of what the organization is about, and they know what some of the barriers are. And we present some of those barriers to some senior people to go, hey, can you help us with these barriers? But the thing about it is that the end result is something that's been co-designed by people in the work itself. So when that is coming to a point where it's about to be ready, then that person who's doing it pulls other people in. It's that their colleagues, it's not someone external like me, it's their colleagues. So what actually happens is there's that discussion and integration. And because it's already done by someone in the front line, it's recognizable and aligned already with, oh no, actually this is better, this is good. No, this is good. As opposed to the kind of work that I do on my own and bringing it in. So that's, I guess, my answer to some of these questions about resistance. If there's resistance, I find that there's something that I can do differently with my approach. So put it that way around. 
not can I communicate more? Can I put out how wonderful this is? And no, it's the other way around. It's like, how can I bring people to actually design this? And that includes the manager. That's really, really important. The manager of the service or the managers that are connected to this have to be a part of it. Not full time. They don't have to design it, but they have to be a part of it. They have to feel that they can have an input. And my job is to help that team go in the right direction. So they're not all going off in different directions, but go in the right direction. So that's, I think, my answer to some of the post-its that have been placed there. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to be quiet, finish that. I'm going to add my, my couple of uh, points on here, and I will hand over to the next person. Um, and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Bernd. Uh, you, you raise your hand, I think. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Anna is unmuted. Please go ahead, let us know. Thanks, Brent. Um, so I totally agree with everything John said um, about the importance of ownership of the thinking and the doing being with the people who really do the work. Um, and that's something that... You know, I I've also learned and then relearned the hard way over the years. And I think quite often it can be really challenging when often there's an expectation that we as the helper or the consultant or the project person or the change agent, that, that we are the ones who come up with the answers um, or do the work. But actually, you know, where I have in the in the in the few instances, I have to say, where I have managed to help bring about like sustainable, meaningful systemic change, because it's flipping hard, as I'm sure everyone here appreciates. Um, the reason that, I've, that that's been successful has been because it's been properly owned in the right place. So really endorse that. I think to build on that point a bit further, yeah. I've come to appreciate that it's it's not enough to be right. So, you know, the sorts of skills we need if we're trying to bring about system change in, within an organisation are humility, um, emotional intelligence, uh, facilitation and curiosity and, and feeling like even even if we even if we know if we think we know what the answer is, being genuinely humble enough to appreciate that, you know, the, there will be there will always be many perspectives on the question of you know what what, what would make this system better and and also you know what, what do we mean by what do we mean by the, the system i mean I'm, you know i'm a big fan of trying to avoid jargon actually where possible i've i've come to appreciate and you know trying to um think in real stuff um and only bring in the language of system thinking if it's helpful to do so um i think another thing that's really important is helping colleagues you know including senior leaders and colleagues in the services to really have an experience for themselves about you know what what is the real situation that's going on and what is the what it, how is it that citizens or people outside the organization really experience um, our services and, and what we do um you know, and, and it could be that that's through going and sitting on the reception desk um, of a council. That's always a good. That's always a good move. For example, um, if you know if there are face to face interactions still, um, or it could be listening to phone calls, or or you know reading the mobile messaging coming in as as is as is the late the latest um, kind of entry point for how how do people actually contact the organisation? I appreciate that that's um, that that would be applicable to service organizations where people ask for stuff so there'll be different types of organization where that's less appropriate but um you know it's an example of a type of experience that it's just really powerful you know and i saw in the post-it notes someone mentioned you know how does oh, the, the difficulty of linking uh systems thinking with project management or governance and things like that yeah i really hear you it's really difficult i've tried to blend the two i'm always a pragmatist i've tried to blend the two um, and it is fundamentally very difficult 
um, to, 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 to help make the case in a rational written report as to as to why we need to take a system thinking approach to, to changing things. People need to experience it for themselves. They need to feel that pain and then they need to be facilitated to really reflect on why is that happening? Uh, you know, and, and that um, that link between what's going on, why is that happening and what, you know, what's the impact is a really uh, straightforward kind of framework, which I have found really helpful. You know, that can be used in a simple conversation with with some colleagues, or it could it could be a bigger piece of work, but that that relationship, and you know, um, what's the impact from multiple perspectives? What's the impact from the citizens' perspective, from colleagues' perspective, from the organisation's perspective, from the perspective of cost, strategic objectives, and um, and so you know, I think often I think the value that I can add really, um, as a flexible helper, is to help reveal the system to the people who work within it so that they have the opportunity to think differently about that and do different stuff and apply different thinking um so um, and, and then final slightly unrelated point gosh it's nice having the floor um i could go on forever i'll hand over to mariana in a moment for your reflections or for your for your initial reflections um on the subject of resistance there's a very um, helpful, specific framework which which I which I was told by a, a fellow colleague of mine, James Yerke, um, many years ago. Which is resistance has if if resistance is winning, um, it means that there is not enough dissatisfaction with the current system. There's not a clear vision for what could be different. And, and or there are not clear first steps. So those those seem to be the key things that trigger resistance. So if, if you're facing resistance, just have a think, right? Well, is there enough dissatisfaction with the current situation? Maybe not, what, what else can we do to generate that? Do we have a clear enough vision of what, what would great look like? And or, you know, are the first steps clear for how we get there? Um, there we go. Mariana, what are your thoughts? Many thanks for 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 that to, to you to you both. Um, and in a sense, maybe I can I can start from where from where you left it. Maybe sharing a little bit how I get into system thinking uh, uh, as a kind of as as a person as as as, as you guys uh, and and um, how um, yeah. And then and then I will maybe pick three kind of three types of of posts that I saw in there and share and share a few tools and things I I used. Uh, for for that, so maybe just to say that I I got to system thinking out of necessity, in the sense that I am very concerned about the state of the world, in particular with mainly I I take an environmental angle to it, and I was desperate that the way we were doing things were not taking us to better results, right? And that's out of necessity. I looked for something, so I was I was fairly enough dissatisfied to use to use Anna's Anna's word to actually look for something new. And that takes me a little bit to the, to the first um, post-it that I saw, which is stuck in all ways of thinking. And indeed, um, as, as Anna mentioned, one, one can look into what, what could help people see uh, that there is a problem with the way we, with, with our way of thinking when we are trying to deal complex problems. And I could add, add to that as well, that when we have the opportunity, sometimes we can also think about who else can we help? I mean, some people just do not see a problem and then they do not necessarily want to change their way of thinking. But there are many people out there to whom we can we can help accelerate the journey of, of getting into, into system thinking. And, and so maybe when, when the opportunity arises, maybe sometimes it's about saying, hey, uh, let me let me turn to, to, to another person who may be who may be interested. Then just uh, I saw a few post-its talking about it takes too long. There is, there is a lack of understanding of the benefits. It's too abstract. And here I will, I will make a little bit of, of publicity uh, to the tools and to the, and to the material in this platform. Uh, because at Systems Innovation, uh, we have uh, a number of tools at our disposal, in particular the canvases, the guides, that help us, um, that help us facilitate sessions where people can experiment 
and, and actually get into what they can get out of this themselves rather than someone talking about the value of it. Uh, and, and that's I, I, I could argue that at least for, for me, for, for, um, uh, for my education uh, journey that of course continues uh, forever and, and for the, the introduction of some of these tools to my, to my organization, the, the tools that, that, that the systems innovation platform provide were, were really uh, pivotal. They were, they were fundamental because they allowed me to really, uh, I, let, let, let me take an example, the iceberg model, for example, and there is a canvas uh, for that, is a tool that allows anyone that has never heard about system thinking understand that, hey, we are, we are focused at the tip of the iceberg and what, what are ideas of actions that we could take if we actually look be, beyond the water. So it helps us see that at the end of the day, thinking in systems is also about shifting attention from a focus on parts to a focus on connections, and then it becomes a little bit more concrete. And then, if we apply that to a city, if we apply that to a concrete example, it gets uh, we we can we can actually uh, use those tools to get less less abstract. And then a, a third uh, post-it that I saw was related to a tendency to jump to solutions. Indeed, a tendency to okay, I have a problem. What is the direct solution to that to that problem? I could argue that the tools such as the iceberg model and, and systems dynamics, I, I also find find it to be uh, interesting and, and, and a little bit of an, on, um, it, it, it opens uh, the, the, the sphere of possibilities um, can be used. And, and maybe I can share uh, la later on some experiences, some experience I'm, I'm uh, having right now, combining systems tools with what we call the challenge led approach which is a way of working that focuses on a specific societal challenge and that fosters the type of collaboration that we need to get into more of a transformative solutions to the problems we have. And thus it's a little bit of combination of tools that help us see the system, reveal the system, as, as Anna was, was mentioning, and tools that allow organizations to build this, to create those spaces where people can get together, use those tools and, and eventually collaborate in a different way than what they are they are used to. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mariana. Important steps. Um, John, where, where would you like to take us next? Yeah, no, this is really good because um, what what people have been saying here has spurred me on to with some of the post-its to go a little bit into a slightly different direction which is on reading some of the post-its this is about really getting a different culture this is about getting a different way of understanding things and now that's very very difficult to do within an organization and i think it's imp almost impossible i wouldn't know how to do it so I don't do it. Um, what I do is I create, and I say this to, to, to the leaders when I, when I want to start with them, I say, look, imagine that you've got a small group of people and they're going to go over to that building across the road. They're going to go into a room and they're going to create the new organization or the new service. They're going to do it separate from this organization. So what I ask for is a room and in that room, I put the people that are working in this new experiment or prototype or lab, whatever it is, but working on the new service, let's say. So I physically, we go to that room and then we slowly start to build the artifacts of what we're doing in that room. Now, I don't do it digitally. I do it on the walls. And I do that because I want people to come in and I want them to see and go, wow, what, what's going on here? This is really interesting. So this is breaking down that resistance to change and the barriers. Some of you have mentioned barriers, particularly the barrier between the front line and decision makers and leaders. And what I do is when I engage the senior people within the organization, which is absolutely crucial, I will bring them into that room and say, this is what we're doing. And I will get the team to take them round and show them, yeah, so last week, this is what we did. We found this and we found that. And they point to the bits on the wall that we're doing. Now that that addresses senior people in a very different way to sending them a PowerPoint or a report or any kind of presentation. It gets them much more connected to the work and they start to have a conversation with those in the team going, hang on a minute, so what did you find here? So there's this conversation going and it builds 
it builds a, a it automatically builds a learning discussion so i call it the bubble so we're in that room and we're in the bubble and anyone that wants to come and see what we're doing we have an open door and people come into that bubble and that's what i use as a way to take a different way of working and a different way of thinking because slowly what happens in that room is a new culture emerges because that team start to work together in a way that they weren't doing outside of that room and when the managers come in they go wow this is you know what have you done and 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 they go well we haven't done anything we're just working together <laughs> it's like oh there's no special technique i mean obviously as a facilitator in the way that um uh, you have been describing Anna. Uh, I work in that way, so I kind of make it happen. But it's them that actually create that at the same time as creating the new change or the new design. Now, sometimes it can be quite low level, and sometimes it can be quite transformational. But I think that bubble is perhaps the most important method that I've learned to use. Um, for so many reasons. So I've attempted to describe that. And, um, and yeah, that, that's kind of my answer to some of the post-its that are out there and some of the things that we've been talking about. So uh, I'll stop now and hand over, hand over to Anna. Thanks, John. That sounds really interesting. Um, building on that, I'd like to come to this question question which is mentioned in some of the post-its around um, executive boundaries um I think one of the key barriers and I know I've faced this as well is that quite often senior leaders kind of understandably just want to focus on their bit uh, the way that we've carved up our organizations is is so reductionist and functionally split inevitably um I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, I'm sure people, the vast majority of people would like to be thinking. It would appear that Anna is frozen. Normally that's my screen. Yes. She froze for me as well. Yeah. John, back to you. Um, okay, if Anna's frozen, should we go straight to Mariana uh, to continue? Would that, be, would that be more helpful? And then once Mariana's finished, hopefully Anna will come back. Oh, she's gone. So sh should we do yeah. that? Yes, let's do that as we wait that Anna comes back. Okay, so I, 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 con I continue to reflect on some of the post-its, is that what I'm doing, right? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, um, so maybe I see, um, so I see one, one, one post-it related to um, tech optimism and um, control and short-termism short of, of projects. Um, there as well, I, I could argue that, that some of the, of the, of the notions of, of system thinking and systems innovation uh, could help shift a little bit the attention on how we use technology for. So not necessarily um, uh, kind of moving away from, from that binary discussion of for or, or, against, or, or against technology that, that uh, I, I see in, in several places, but more, uh, okay, technology, but for, for, doing, for doing what? And the, systems of, the, the notion of systems innovation is a lot about, about technology for, for how 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 we could be doing things differently at, at the systems level and how technology can help us with with that. Um, so that is what got my my attention there. Um, let me look for. Uh, I could also chime in, uh, Bernd, if if that's, that's a good time. Uh, just to pick. Up while Stana drops off. Um, so yeah, I'm Joss from from SI and have uh, been trying to introduce systems thinking in various ways at, at various levels for for quite some time. I, I just did a post recently on LinkedIn that was resonated with people. It was after a conversation with uh, people at the UN and different departments there, and 
Um, they're both trying to make change happen within this very large bureaucratic organization. The UN is 120,000 people, and it's very siloed in terms of the different programs that it runs. Um, and a lot of great people in that organization. Um, but we also know it's a system that's uh, quite dysfunctional in many ways. Uh, it does a lot of great things, but it also has a lot of problems. So there are a lot of people, um, you know, enlightened and inspiring people in the UN system who are trying to make change there. So it's quite a classic example of what we're talking about here. And the people I talked to were recognizing that when change comes from above and um, you make uh, people change, uh, Peter Senge talks about that. No one wants to be, no one wants to be changed, um, right? So the number of people is zero that wants to be changed. Um, the number of people that want help or support in doing their job better is pretty much everyone. So maybe that's a better pathway um, instead of, because at the UN, you can kind of do that. You've got this hierarchy and you can tell people to go and do that and that, and maybe it'll work for a short period, but they, they kind of recognize really that it's not sustainable. So they're taking a different approach in terms of how can we provide them with the right tools to address the challenges, to support them in addressing the challenges they face, right? Um, but those tools are not the business as usual tools. Those That thinking is not the business as usual thinking. Um, it's actually different thinking. It's going to take them to a different place if they adopt it over time. Um, and potentially um, a number of different tools that could over time integrate into a new uh, kind of different way of doing things. So I thought, I've always thought about that kind of asynchronous uh, way of making change happen instead of, you know, the big jump, which no one is prepared to make. Um, but the kind of small change where you create things that are of value and utility for people now. So they want, they're attracted to use it, but over time, those are part of a potentially different system in the future. So I think that's a really interesting aspect uh, for me of how you can make change in a way that is both aspirational because it's reflective. What you're creating is reflective of a system you'd like to bring into the world in the future, but it's also practical now in terms of, people want to use it and adopt it and um, you can make change happen through attracting people in that in that way instead of trying the usual approach which doesn't really work in, in the long run I don't think uh, do we have Anna back uh, yeah oh she's I, just she's just joining now yeah yeah doesn't seem to be stable I've now let her in twice <sighs> But um, actually, uh, you, you you see that uh, there's that really interesting aspect of um, a change period um, is different to a stable period. Um, there's work done in the NHS and, and other organizations studying how in a normal period, a person at the top of the hierarchy has a large influence. But when it actually comes to transformation and change, um, it's a lot more about people's networks uh, because it's about the influence that they they have. It's very difficult to tell people to do things, to make change. But it's uh, we start changing when we get influences from our network around us, um, uh, the people who we're, we're similar to, right, and the people who are like us. We go and talk to them, and if they say, oh, I'm trying something different, um, you're, we're already referring to it. So that's why uh, networks become very important in the context of change. And it's more about the influential people in those networks uh, rather than the people who are at the top of uh, a hierarchy. Um, so that's a really interesting reflection about um, how power actually changes in, a, in quite a significant way when it comes to change. It's the network that really enables change uh, rather than the hierarchy so much, which is more about the stable, routine, predictable kind of um, organization. Anna, I was filling in for you. Um, hopefully you're back with us. Oh, thank you. Sorry for my internet connection. Hopefully uh, it'll be all right now. Um, I was just, um, and that sounds like a really interesting uh, build as well um, on, on the, the point about uh, networks and hierarchies. Thank you. Um, yeah, fasc fascinating subject, but yeah, it feels really important. Oh. Hello? Don't, don't yeah. worry. Just we can hear you. So, um, sorry, I'm just on my mobile phone now. I can't really see this, but hopefully at least you can see. Um, so one way in which I have tried to kind of soften those boundaries between the different bits of the organisation that different leaders are in charge of is, um, you know, I, along with some 
of my system thinking colleagues, I designed and uh, co-facilitated a systems leadership development program um, for all of the, the most senior 22 people um, at my local authority. Um, and that was all about helping leaders learn how to take a systems approach. Um, and it was you know, properly weaving theory and practice. Um, and it, with my particular group of four directors, we, I, I got them to take ownership of exactly which bit of the system they wanted to delve into um, and, and, and what work more on. And, and so we, we, they decided they wanted to go and spend some time on our housing estates um, with caretakers. So we went along um, and we had a really good tour from some of our caretakers who were just fantastic um, colleagues. You know, they, they, they were doing all sorts of fascinating system stuff that wasn't in their official job descriptions, you know, taking shopping in for residents that, that couldn't walk and, you know, things that you just wouldn't expect. Really interesting revelations about what's really going on in the system. And one of the things that we, we came across um, on the estate of uh, Kilburn, actually, um, in quite a deprived area of Camden was we came across this huge concrete slab. We called it the, the concrete slab. If you, can, if you can imagine a huge housing estate with a big o o open area right in the middle. Um, and it, it, was, it was a really big open concrete slab that was totally fenced off. So you couldn't get into it. There was no gate. It, it just felt like such a waste of space. And these leaders I was with were and myself as well, but I was helping them think. They were really curious about, you know, why is, what is this space for? What, what did it used to be? A, maybe a play area or something? Like, wh why is this a waste of space? And, and who's thinking about this? You know, this is, you know, we know that we've got major health inequalities in this area. You know, we've got children that don't attend school that often. You know, we've got so much, so many challenges. And yet we've got this space we don't seem to be making the, the, the use of it. So I, I helped them reflect on this and they came they came up with an action plan for what they would go and investigate further to understand what's going on here. Um, so they, 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 they took their actions and they went off to speak to different people in the council, youth services, libraries, you know, who, who, might, who might know the story of this area? And lo and behold, nobody in the organisation had a clue um, about what was going on with this particular um, concrete slab and that that was the learning it was that it's nobody's job because it doesn't fit into any of our categories of service and so that that was the learning and 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 that was that and other things was one of the things that really helped shift our leaders thinking towards feeling that they need to think beyond their bit and actually you know paying attention to place a lot more so you know what 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 is actually going on in this local area and how can we think from the perspective of place, you know, how can we really optimise this and make it work better and work with residents to, to think differently about it? So that, that's one example of that. Who's next? Nice. Thank you, Anna. Who would like to go next? Right. I think I'm next, aren't I? So, um, it's really great because again i'm going to build on what has been talked about here and i think that um focusing in on helping people to connect how to get managers away from what they're doing and focusing on this um how to get stakeholders to all focus in the same direction how to get people interested and and the very first point that we spoke about um was we can't really do much until there is a desire for change. You can't, you can't force people to change when they don't know why they're doing it or what the reason is. And in particular, decision makers. Why on earth would any decision maker spend time and resources because something wants to change? It has to mean something to them. It has to be a business improvement. It has to be something substantial. And, and that's the first thing, like with Anna, that I always do. But what I want to talk about is how do I do it? When I first started doing change, I loved numbers. I, I got really into using Excel and the formulas and I thought, right, coming up with these graphs that, that show all sorts of things. And it was really disappointing when I thought that I was really demonstrating something fundamental and people were looking at it and making their own views about it that was very different to mine. And then 
I learned something from somebody and they said, you can't really change thinking through rational means. You can't do it rationally. It's not an argument. It's not a discussion. So I don't discuss this with anybody. I do something very different now. I show them so that they can see it for themselves. So that's one of the cornerstones of the approach I have today. And what I will do, and I think Anna um, hinted at this with her approach, I will take anybody, in particular senior people, and I will show them something that they go, oh my good God, what the hell's going on here? So I'll give you the, the most simple example, but it's, it, it demonstrates this. I was working with an organization um, quite new, and I'd met the chief executive for the first time, and we'd just about to start a meeting, like five or 10 minutes before the beginning. I hadn't met him before. So he said, oh, what's all this about? Well, it's about a different way of looking at how we design the work. That means nothing, of course. So I said, look, when I came here uh, 20 minutes ago, um, I understand that there was already there was already a flip chart that was meant to be put here. Yeah, 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 we'd organized that. So the flip chart was there, but there were no pens. So when I asked the person with the flip chart, where are the pens? He goes, oh, that's nothing to do with me. That's a different department. So I was explaining this to the chief exec and he was, he was going, oh, so you got the flip chart, but you didn't get the pens. And he goes, I know why, because the pens are in consumables and the flip chart is not in consumables in a different department. And I only asked one person to provide the flip chart, but I assumed they would deliver the pens, but they didn't. Now, he then put his head in his hands because he realized silo working. He realized the split that was an artificial split between two different things that should have been connected together. So I didn't need to explain systems thinking. I showed him something. So by the time the meeting started, he had got the idea of why I was there in a very real way. That's what I always try and do now. And I, at the beginning, I used to talk about systems thinking, and now I don't. I really try and show something to somebody that they recognize that's part of their own organization. And I'm going to say that I call this sense making, because this is about experiences. This is not about data, it's not about numbers, not about graphs. This is about sense making, which is someone apply looking at something or experiencing something and that having an effect on them and that's what i do and i think that i can't do the work that i do without doing that it is for me absolutely critical and i think that with systems thinking this is something that goes hand in hand with that and i think a, a lot of people uh and People showed me that and it, it really helped me. So that's why I want to bring it up here because I think that that is, um, uh, it, it's something that as sort of the more traditional project management, uh, change approaches, they tend not to do that. They tend to focus on more rational approaches. And I think that's generally a mistake. And if it takes time to show somebody, I try and look for that thing that they can see it really quickly. And, and if I've got half an hour with, especially a senior manager, I will spend time before that half an hour designing something that I can take them there and show them something. So that's what I wanted to say. Great. Thanks, John. Mariana? Yes, maybe maybe to, to, to build on what, what, what John was, was just saying, the importance, and someone else as well in the in the chat was talking about the importance of uh, facilitating the understanding of, of systems moving from abstract to, to concrete and, and making this as close as possible to what people care about. And indeed, I could say on, on, on the how kind of on, the, on, on how, how to go about introducing this in the organization, I think that what John mentioned is, is fairly fundamental, the fact that um we we often we often need to create a space and the preparation of of those sessions and and before the the work that needs to be there before before that uh, that space is 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 fairly key because we if we don't have a good understanding of what uh, 
what are the problems that people are trying to, are trying to solve and if we don't bring concrete examples of, on how often often the people we are talking to uh, are very busy they don't have time for for theory or for or for or for solving other type of problems than the ones they have and that's I good I could say that that preparation that John uh, mentioned and that that um yeah preliminary work to understand where is the person coming from what is the problem they are what is the the pain points for for them and what are the tools that we can bring to help them look at that problem differently and and, and solve it uh, I think it's 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 very very interesting. I can maybe share the um, the experience we had in Ireland uh, two years ago, where where we brought system thinking to uh, reflect about how policies can decarbonize uh, their passenger passenger transport sector. And they had, I mean, the 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 it was a very conducive environment in the sense that they had a very concrete problem. They had set an ambitious climate target, and with the list of actions they had even if they implemented all of them, there was a gap. So they needed a different way of looking at things uh, that allowed them to, came, to come up with actions that reduce emission uh, faster. And, and that's, we, we built really on, on that, on that um, problem and try to identify which tools could help us um, get to different solutions than the one that the one they had just maybe to share to share the type of tools we use in case in case you're interested in in, in very concretely what what we did and um, so we we used um qualitative systems dynamics to show to to make the point that you cannot transform a system if you are not able to see that system so reveal the system as, as anna mentioned before we also used uh, stock and flows and dynamics to to show how the system lock in um determine whether your action, your policy was ambitious enough or not. We also used mental model analysis. We insisted a lot on the importance of changing ideas. We insisted a lot on the fact that the same system produces the same results and that the same ideas likely produce the same system. For that, we also used the, the iceberg model quite, quite a lot. Uh, and, and yeah, the preparation of those spaces and the understanding of the of the problem uh, beforehand was was uh, fundamental. Great, Anna, tell us more. Thanks. Um, that was really interesting, Mariana. I would like to pick up on a few other post its and comments in the chat. Um, I think um, so. I think someone said recently that we all work as external consultants. So I'm I've actually never worked as an external consultant. I've only been an internal, and I I I I, I love working within an organisation, being part of it. Um, I think something that I have come to appreciate is the importance of building. Well, I suppose it's easier as an internal, but building those relationships with people and being seen as helpful and then realizing that that we're helpful before we try and do anything too radical or try and change shift shift people's thinking or system too too much so that that, that relationship as a foundation stone is just so important um and I, and I have to say I am I have become quite pragmatic about how I go about any work that I do um I one of the post-it notes uh, which really resonated with me because I've heard it so many times is systems thinking takes too long. Now, of course, that that could be um, the, a mask for all sorts of resistance that, that's going on, people not appreciating the value of it, etc. But I, I would say having, you know, having kind of led on and the, my, my team have been involved with, you know, quite a lot of system thinking interventions that have ended up fizzling because we've just lost momentum um you know sometimes this this stuff does take years and if you I think there's a difference between pace and momentum and I I I, I always say what we it's important to have momentum pace is a, a bit of a red herring because pace 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 it's difficult to think things through thoroughly and you can easily work on the wrong things if you're focused too much on getting things done really quickly so momentum rather than pace i would i would suggest um but you know it is 
it is possible to help someone take a system thinking approach just in a single conversation. It doesn't have to be a huge piece of work. You know, it, by taking a coaching approach, helping someone really reflect on their perspective and what alternative, what are the options they've got for how they might be thinking about it can in itself be really helpful and unlocking, certainly as a first step in order to build rapport and um, credibility. Um, so that, so that, that's one potential tip there. Um, but, but, but having said that, yeah, in order to fundamentally change, you know, big systems, yeah, it's, it's worth, it's worth really trying not to put a time limit on it and not, not let that be a constraint. Um, as long as you've got momentum and, and clear checkpoints where you're able to reflect on what's going on and, and iterate and continuously improve. So it is, it is a tricky one. Um, another, I'll, I'll reflect on one more theme before I hand back to John. And um, there are a few post-its about design and you know how can we link systems with um oh am i still here yes my battery is uh, running a bit low sorry oh yeah a little last um how can we link system thinking with design um and also i'd like to touch on inclusion and diversity and equitability which um are just such important things i think i i, I really feel that it's possible to really helpfully link system thinking with all of these things. I think I think they they work really well together. And I know John will have lots more to say specifically on systemic design and and the thinking that and the the things he's written about that. Um, but I just wanted to reflect that you know I as as someone with a system thinking background who's more recently been learning about the world of service design, um, you know I I think I think the two work really well together. And I've 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 learnt. I've come to appreciate the value of things like sprints and retros um, and, the, and those sorts of things, which, which are kind of come from the design world. And I've just finished reading the most amazing book uh, by Hilary Cottam with an M, Radical Help, uh, which actually is not that old, only a few years old. Hilary Cottam, um, for anyone that doesn't know, um, is a kind of social activist who's done an awful lot of um quite interesting experiments with system change in, in different ways. She was designer of the year in 2005. Um, but when I read this book, I just thought, well, I feel like this is a bit of an up-to-date system thinking Bible actually. Um, so yeah, I really, um, it really just, it just pulled together all of my critique of public services and why, why the, the case to change, but also some specific ideas for how to go about it. So I'd recommend that if anyone fancies it. John. Gosh. <clears throat> wow. Now, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to talk about design. Firstly, it's very important. It's so important that I can't talk about it here because as soon as we start, I'm going to be a lot longer than my seven minutes. I think it's probably another event. I think it's another discussion because um, <clears throat> that one is central to me. I can't do this without having a design methodology an understanding of how I introduce this together with some other things. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Um, but I think some of the, one of the things that's coming out and with the post-its, this is really about, it's less about systems thinking. That systems thinking is for us, but for the people we're working with, it's about a business focus. It's about what's the, what's, what if what impact will the change have what's what will i be doing differently what will be different in the organization when this occurs whatever it is so i'm very keen to highlight that when i engage with people when they come into the bubble that's what i'm focusing on i'm focusing on them seeing the waste and all the things that are going wrong and someone put up a post-it about how do you get people to be so open and honest? Well, in that room, nothing goes out of that room. So whatever we talk about in that room, we keep in that room, including and especially when senior people come in. And we explain that to senior people before they come in. And what happens there is I'm trying to remove fear and I'm trying to generate a new culture of openness, um, 
and for people to bring their true selves into that room. That's ultimately what's going to occur. So as the days go on, people change and they become more open and they start to say things that they've always wanted to say, but never had the ability to say it. And for the managers, I prepare them when they, before they come in to say that they, they may hear things which they may agree or disagree with, but whatever you do, don't respond. Just listen and nod. And if you disagree, don't, don't worry, we'll talk about it, you and me afterwards. So I'm, I'm beginning now to work with those senior people and that, those managers. And I make that part of this work. And for me, that's more important than anything else, because if that doesn't work, I know that whatever the team do, it won't go anywhere. It won't go anywhere, not because it's not great. It's because the people that are going to make that are making decisions haven't understood the benefit of it or the or the um, why they sh why why they should allow this to happen. So that is really the key. And when I switched from being me trying to f show people how great this was to a business focus, that fundamentally changed how I approach this with with decision makers and how they saw me. They saw me as helping them with their business, as opposed to bringing in something new, bringing in design, bringing in systems thinking. They didn't care less what I brought in. They just wanted the, whatever it was to improve. And that's, that's kind of, uh, I think we're coming up to a certain time now. So, uh, and I better stop talking. So that's kind of my, my, learning from the past years in terms of what's made me a lot more effective. Thank you. Nice. Um, let's do one more round. Maybe Mariana. Um, I, I stopped reading the post it's huh? <laughs> so so I will I will continue from from the last sentence from from John and and I wonder if if it could make sense as well to maybe open open to to questions and and to remarks from the from the audience I, I also don't get to 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 read the chat um um on on what has maybe you, you ended up saying what made me more more effective um maybe one one thing on on my side um and it's related to what we were talking at, um, yeah, mentioning mentioning before, uh, is this idea of um, adapting what I share to the problems people have. So really making it as useful and as concrete and as hands on as possible. Uh, another thing that um, has been useful is to avoid confrontation. Uh, confrontation, at least in my experience, has never really worked uh, to, to uh, spark curiosity, which I think is in a sense what we what we can be doing, spark curiosity on what this different way of thinking can help us see and do uh, differently than what we do uh, today so that people can can continue uh, and look for, for, for material and stuff and, 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 and come to this platform and, and use the tools, etc. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe I'll stop there so that I also let, let, leave some time for, for people to, to comment uh, and, and, and questions or whatever. Okay, great. Then let's wrap up this part of the meeting. Uh, let me look at maybe Paloma, Andrea, is there a burning question from the chat that we should address? No, right. I, mean, I think I think there you're going. Uh, you have been like answering everything on the chat. Um, pretty much, you've been engaging. Um, maybe if someone has like a very important question that wasn't answered, they can just do like an open mic uh, kind of thing. There was something about the mental models, I think, maybe, that they were asking about. But Josh, uh, or John, I think, uh, answered already. Okay, good. Um, Anna. So then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop some links, and then I'll leave you to it. Okay, you drop the links, and we, we let Anna come forward. 
Thanks. Um, there was one other post that I was hoping to pick up on, uh, which was systemic team coaching. So it was just to reflect that, you know, we, we, we've been thinking about systems um, in terms of services and in terms of um, causes and consequences within organisations. But I think I th something that I think is really helpful as well is thinking about teams as systems um, in themselves. And that can be a really powerful in to introducing systems thinking, actually. Um, in terms of building credibility so you know thinking what's the purpose of the team and, and sort of how effective is it at achieving that purpose and what are those dynamics between the members of the team and how can we work on those things um there was a course i did a few years ago by an organization called orsk organization and relationship system coaching which was just amazing it was just wonderful um which, which really kind of brought to life that lens on you know, how to improve effectiveness in organizations. That's it. Thanks, Anna. Um, I haven't seen any raising hands. Is that right? And if that is the case, then I, I'd love to share the screen again. Oh, before I do that, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, John. That was great. Thanks for sharing your views and perspectives. That's very inspirational. Um, you you will capture some more ideas, I guess, in in the fourth step. I'm now sharing my screen again. Hope that works. I would like us collectively to go to step number five. And I, we would like to ask you, are there challenges, patterns, topics that that are so important and they have such a weight that you would like us to take these forward. Take a sticky note, take many sticky notes, write these topics down, put them here in the under number five and put your name in case it is okay to share that because we might want to get in touch with you. We might also want you right now to speak up and present that topic that you see that is very important to take forward uh, we are not claiming that we're going to make let's say a webinar but we want to take it forward in all possible ways it could be a webinar it could be a workshop it could be whatever that might be just let us know what that what inspires you and what should be taken forward and then we figure out how that can be. And there is an invitation attached to that. When we speak of co-creation here, we really mean it. So it might be that one or the other of the audience might want to present a particular challenge, a case, a case study, uh, make another round of conversations, for example, as we share. Um, all of this could be ideas, but hey, it's not up to me to say that. I'm just trying to inspire you to let us know what could be great ideas to take these topics forward. What, what are these topics? What could be the setting? And would you like to engage in that yourself? Hence, put your name there if you like, uh, and then we can get in touch with you in the future. Because this for us would be a great value of, of this meeting now to capture what you guys need what the challenges really are going forward and what we could do about it. And raise your hand. I don't see that now because I'm looking into the Miro, but somebody will identify that. Raise your hand if you wanna talk, if you wanna suggest something beyond just putting it into the into there's the actually, There's actually someone yeah. raising their hand. Yep, when Roland. Yeah. There we go. Let us know. Hi. Yeah, Hi. can you hear me well? Oh, yes. Oh, a um, uh, I have a question because we've addressed silos in, in, in business, but we always have a hint when, when we talk about that. We're we're in the business. The situation I have is very peculiar. Is I'm bringing a, an ecological project 
to the table, but the table is in silos. And I have no I have no ends to the cities. I, I, mostly I work with cities. I have no ends in the city to make or to bring change to them, um, to, to, to make possible change. So how can I bring a, a system thought <laughs> uh, project to a, a structure that is siloed? And that's one of the, that's the biggest challenge I have is bringing a project thought in systems to a place where systems are really not part of the culture. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I hope it's clear. <laughs> Thank you, Wen. Um, who would like to answer that from our speakers? Um, I mean, that's a great one to put in onto the um, onto the board. Um, I'm going to answer very briefly, if that's okay. Sure. I'm very often there with, let, let me call them different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And they've come into the same room and they're all going in different directions. They all have different priorities. Some of them have resources, some of them don't. Some of them like some people, some of them don't like the others. And what I will do in preparation before that session is understand what is the common purpose of why we're here not just why we're here in that room, but why are we here as part of a system? What is the purpose of that system? And help people to see that we are all a part of that. And by doing that, we all have our differences, but actually that's the ultimate focus that we should be having. And let's go around the room and talk about when that focus is going in the wrong direction. So it's kind of like getting honesty and openness out. Now, I. I do that, and I don't know your context um, exactly, but I think that's one answer that I try and do. And, and I usually can spend a lot of time preparing people before they come into the room, maybe having one-to-one -one discussions with them before that occurs. So that's very briefly uh, my, my answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Was that helpful, Wen? It's it's helpful, and, and but I'm sure I'm not the only one who who has like they 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 go and get you. They ask you to come and do something for them, and they they're attracted to what you offer, and you share that it's systems, and you share that it's you know complex, and that we'll we'll need to work together. And they're like, yeah, 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 we understand, Anna. But when it's time to go to work, that's where um, that's where it breaks down you know because people are in their little silo thinking about their thing and we have a great project together but maybe this together that we share isn't um as connected as it could be or as um uh, clear for everyone so anyways the, the only way i've been able to make uh you know to 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 help with that situation is to bring more information and give example and make it make it so that people understand how important their part is in the system but they still feel like they're just a part of the system and i i have no you know it would be somebody else who would have to do that because when they come and get me it's not my my role is not to tell you know the boss of let's say the um, the travel public like a uh, public uh, work and the person who's in the environment and the person who's in the the yeah. let's say the gardening section they're all in their things and i'm trying to make them you know work together yeah. and yeah, but it, i yeah. could i could speak to that a little bit if it's uh okay um actually i'm gonna reference i'm gonna point in the direction of mariana because um that's how I understand your project in Ireland, Mary, and I'm not sure how much you can talk about that. And it's similar. That's actually a very common scenario. Um, to give the challenges complex, so we talk about people uh, in relation to climate change, uh, cities, um, um, which Marianne is working on, but other contexts of climate change, you, you'll find that the system is not set up right. Um, and as you say, they normally want to buy a solution, which is a project that's going to fix the problem for them, right? And systems approach are kind of the opposite from that. Um, so 
you know, it's quite often a scenario that where you actually have to yeah, re restructure the organization in some way. And and again, that can be, uh, hopefully Mariana can talk about this because that's what her project's about. I'm not sure how much she can, you know, talk about projects, but um, you you can, if if they, if you get them to recognize that uh, when, then you can help them, right, run workshops to reorganize themselves and start to change. Um, so you've got to try and help them understand that and convince them of that um, and then support them in making those changes. But I think Mariana, maybe you'd like to say that. Yes, maybe, maybe what I can say, and, and to me, to me, the, the, the first steps, and that's where that's where so far the the environment in 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 the work we have been doing in Ireland has been that conducive because we get there uh, with a problem related to the way they are working already recognized. Uh, without that step, we couldn't be able uh, to to bring the the ideas and the approaches uh, that we're bringing. So if that is not present yet, to me that is the first step because we, without that, why could you change? Right, change. Uh, is 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 an effort for our brain, and that's uh, kind of the the problem. The gap needs to be to me. That's that's the first step. What in 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 the project I'm working on, uh, it it happens that they already see that problem. They they they. So we are we are we are a step ahead in that in that in that um um sense, and and we are they are a step ahead. We didn't do much to for for that to happen really. And and that is that is where um there is the space, there is the willingness to identify space for experimentation. That said, uh, of course, we are, we, are, we are working with a city that needs to provide services and that need to make sure that those services are stable and they are vital services, really. And that's uh, what we are trying to, what, what, what has been useful so far, and we are at the beginning of, of the project. But it's, it's also to, to show that it's not about rethinking everything, because in a sense, the silos, the departments, they work for a lot of things. For anything that needs to be stable and needs to be provided, they work fine. They do not work, however, for more disruptive ideas, for doing things differently than what we were used to do. And that's what we're trying to, to look at is how can we bring that space. And I, I remember just that this is this was a, an image you wrote at a certain point where, where there were the silos, right? And a lot of people in the silos. And 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 once you said, well, this is to, to, to trigger systems innovation, it's about creating this space where these people can leave their silos, at least for a while, think differently, work differently, and then go back to their silos because change in the silos is very difficult, right? And that's what we're trying to, 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 to look at. How can we both work with the structure that is there and create those spaces that are more informal, that are more about, just was talking about networks, creating those networks beyond the silos. Um, and and, and so, so far, so far we have, we have, uh, there, there has been a lot of interest on that. What can uh, can be done there? Now, what we are we are looking at is how can we free some resources for that to happen? Because of course, uh, everyone is busy, and if this space, if this uh, different way of thinking is additional to what everything else, to everything else that needs to be done, well, that's that's problematic. People just do not have the the space to do that. That's we are trying to to understand how can this. Um, where there are synergies so that this way of working can reduce work on one side and so that we free up free up some of that that space i'm not sure if, if useful that's what what came came to mind thanks that's great it's just i feel that people want the fruit without growing the tree that's what i feel often because after i leave after my project is finished it is finished what happens? It's not uh, fixed thing. It's living. I work with plants. I work with people, and that's that's where the growth has to come. And well, thanks everyone for your input. Great. Is there any other burning sign out there that I don't see? Then I suggest we we wrap step number five up. Um, we from the organizations team, we've learned a lot and it's it's interesting the to read the sticky notes that you've put here. Obviously, there are two, three stickies that relate to each other. I mean the one on the need to create a systems toolkit. That is in fact the next white paper topic that we would like to work on. And this session is actually inspiring that work on the systems toolkit. 
for organizations. So that was an easy response from our side. I think we will be very inspired by some of your sticky notes here because I believe um, workshop framing, the language, the silos, this should one way or the other enter that toolkit. It should become part of the playbook. So we will try to give that a go, make another webinar with you guys and see where we are. Somebody's writing in big letters, sustainability, that would be one of the change areas which could be addressed, the impact of an organization. Um, so there we go. We come back, write more on on this um, on this Miro. We will collect it and we're gonna reach out like here, for example, to Eva. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Let's finish the meeting then. We would like you to give us a quick feedback and I have to zoom out so we can go to that space. We're not gonna do the question of what are we gonna do next? We just ask you for, for your kind feedback here. And I use the opportunity to thank everybody for your patience and your input, staying for 90 minutes with us. And thank you again to Anna, Mariana and John and all the other colleagues from the org team and you guys, which are all here. We don't have 60 people attending that often. So this motivates us to put lots of sweat and effort into our next white paper, which is indeed called the toolkit. Give us ideas, reach out to us, uh, tell us what should be going there. Uh, 